can go. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tim Burke. I'm with SwiftStack. I'm a core developer for Swift and Swift 3. And today I'm talking to you about uh, using Swift as an S3 endpoint. Now, you might be asking, why do that? Swift has an API. It's a great API. I love Swift's API. You can reach in and grab individual segments out of a large object without uh, needing to mess with range requests. You can aggregate logs dynamically based on uh, day or month using dynamic large objects. Swift's API is great. I love it. But you may have already invested in S3 and suddenly realized that, uh, hey, wait, I, I need to start moving some of my workflows, my applications, back into my data center. Uh, Maybe this is because of cost, maybe it's because you want to reduce latency, uh, or alternatively, maybe you're working on a hybrid cloud strategy and you want to be able to have a single API that you can use, whether you're working on your internal network or bursting into the public cloud. And of course, it's always useful to have a ready to spin up test environment when you're developing that application, that workflow, such as my laptop, which is currently running Swift with Swift 3. We're gonna have a nice demo later on. Now, separately, I have another reason to want to run Swift 3 and develop it, hack on it, and it, goes even beyond just trying to make sure that my customers are successful. I do it because it makes Swift itself better. There have been several occasions uh, where I noticed some opportunities to increase concurrency, whether that's with the bulk deleter, with SLO uploads, or uh, I noticed that, hey, wait, Swift client needs to buffer its reads from disk to be able to match the throughput that we're seeing to the same cluster, but with an S3 client. And uh, it goes on and on. There's just so much great stuff to developing a separate object store on top of Swift. So we're going to look at the comparison between Swift and S3. We'll look at an example server config to enable it, uh, client config uh, in particular for AWS's own client, and uh, Bado 3. Have a nice little demo, and I'll cover a few caveats around using Swift 3. Uh, because you know that there have to be a few catches. And finally, I'll try to close with uh, some future directions for what I want to do next. So in S3, top level, you've got your buckets. These map pretty much directly to containers in Swift. Uh, there are three major distinctions, though, between the two. In S3, there is a global bucket namespace. Uh, so if I create a bucket named music, that's it. Nobody else can have a bucket named music. Whereas with Swift, uh, that's not the highest level. Uh, above that is an account, and each tenant gets their own account. So within that, you can create your own containers willy-nilly. Uh, you can have music, I can have music. Those two containers are completely separate. Second major distinction is uh, S3 only lets you have a certain number of buckets. Uh, I believe 100 is the default. Swift has no such practical limitation. Uh, I suppose if you start getting into millions, tens of millions, you're probably going to hit the same sort of problems that uh, Matt's solving with container sharding. But uh, to my knowledge, no customer has ever asked about that. And third, what was that? Yeah, just two. <laughs> so, uh, oh no, the third one, thank you, Matt. That was exactly the person that needed to call that out. Uh, <laughs> so with Amazon, buckets are effectively infinitely deep. You can just keep throwing objects in there, uh, knock yourself out, 
it's fine. Uh, but with Swift, there is going to be a limit. Uh, after about 10 million, 100 million, you're going to see significant performance problems. I hear reports at a billion of just having container DBs lock up, and uh, it's problematic. So within a bucket, you've got objects, and fortunately, names even match between the two. Uh, Swift object, S3 object, basically same idea. Uh, you can attach custom metadata, you can set expirations, it's great. Uh, they have the same five gig uh, max upload size. So to have larger objects, you uh, use a multi-part upload in S3, uh, and now uh, the analog of that in Swift is static large objects. They offer nice consistency guarantees, make sure that uh, what you are reading back out is what you originally put. And both S3 and Swift have ways to generate a shareable URL that will expire after a set amount of time. Uh, the exact signature algorithms differ between the two, but uh, very similar concepts. Uh, so let's see how we configure this. Like most client-facing uh, features of Swift, you go ahead and change your proxy server config. Uh, just drop the Swift 3 middleware into your pipeline, and uh, all the configuration options are just like you've come to expect from Swift. There are three that I'd like to call out. Most of the rest have to do with uh, tuning limits and the like. Uh, first is location. Uh, this is reported in the bucket location API, but uh, the more important reason to note this is that clients need it if they're going to be using V4 signatures. Uh, that gets baked into the signature, and if uh, you have a different region for your client than the location that we set globally in Swift, uh, you're going to get 403s. That's usually the first place that I look if uh, I hear reports of access denied. Uh, second is storage domain. Uh, you can use this to have subdomain style uh, access. So instead of having the bucket in the path of your URL, you can put it in the front of the host name. Uh, third, We've got uh, force swift request proxy log turned on for this demo just to see not only the client request coming in, but also how that gets translated into a swift request on the back end. On the client side, uh, it's kind of hard to give specific uh, detail, uh, recommendations for uh, the wide variety of clients that S3 supports, or rather that support S3. Uh, but four common features are uh, needing to provide the access key ID, which you might recognize as a classic uh, tempoth user. Secret access key, which again, tempoth password in this case. Uh, a region, again, matching our server config and an endpoint URL so that we don't just go talking to Amazon. Uh, to do this demonstration, I'm using a pretty standard Swift all-in-one. Uh, I've got one extra patch layered on top to get V4 signature support for temp off. Uh, I need to bug some people in this very room about landing that. Uh, and I've got Apache reverse proxying to eventlet so that I can uh, have the client pointed at port 80. Some clients have issues talking to non-standard ports. Uh, additionally, Amazon uh, makes it difficult to uh, talk to a different endpoint. 
they do provide a command line option, but because I don't want to have to type that in all the time, I found a uh, AWS CLI plugin to support alternate endpoints, as you had seen in the previous config. And all of the scripts that I'm going to be running are uh, available up on GitHub. I'll be sure to add a tag for uh, this is the very set. So, fingers crossed. First, we'll just start uh, tailing the proxy logs so that we see requests as they come in. Uh, I've got an echo and sleep in there so that we get some new lines like that every so often. And let's just start with Amazon's own CLI. Works great. Uh, you see we set a default profile so that we don't use my ordinary Amazon creds. Uh, list all the buckets. There aren't any. Uh, good, I cleaned up after myself. Uh, create a bucket. List and see that, yep, got a bucket now. Uh, upload a dummy file. And see that, yep, appears in container listings. Hello, world. And then clean up after ourselves. Now, this was with v2 signatures. Same thing works with v4. Uh, and even you can have it go with pre-signed URLs as the command line client, which is a little curious, but hey, why not? Now, over on the proxy, you see uh, a whole bunch of requests have flown by. Uh, let's slow that down a little and see it go with an interactive Python session. Got our standard imports, uh, instantiate a session so that we pull in all that profile information. Uh, unfortunately, with BOTO3, I didn't find a good way to have the endpoint read from config. So instead, uh, you have to specify it manually, but uh, that's a fairly minor change in scope of trying to, uh, much better than trying to rewrite your entire application to talk Swift instead of S3. Uh, we can list the buckets, and you see that the S3 request here got translated into a Swift request there. So uh, get on slash uh, just becomes an account get. Go ahead and create a bucket. Again, we see uh, the S3 versus backend request. and confirm that, yep, shows up in our listings. So uh, Bato has a default of eight megs uh, as the point at which it starts switching between an ordinary upload and a multi-part upload, just to show that uh, multi-part uploads work great. Let's upload 16 meg, sure. See a flurry of requests. Uh, it's a little harder to pick apart the uh, S3 versus Swift requests, but uh, there's the finalization of the multi-part upload, uh, some bookkeeping, uh, the SLO put, yeah, uh, individual segments getting uploaded, all of that. We see that it shows up in the listings for the bucket. And uh, if we read it back, we see that we got the full 16 meg. Works just as you would expect. I see Clay's uh, checking the math on this one. Yeah. And go ahead and clean up after ourselves. Confirm. Good. So there are a few caveats with uh, using Swift 3 uh, to emulate S3. Uh, 
it's not going to entirely match all of the features in S3, to be sure. There are a lot of them, and there are only two of us core reviewers. Uh, in particular, though, some of the things that we do support, such as object level ACLs and uh, honest S3 style bucket ACLs, are uh, going to incur some performance uh, problems uh, as you need to head each object before you uh, do the get so you verify the client was actually authorized to read it. Uh, kind of at odds with that is if you want to support bimodal access, uh, uh, both Swift and S3 clients uh, can look at the same containers. Uh, you, you're going to have to play a bit of a balancing game because the S3 client isn't going to have entirely the experience that they expect if they want some advanced features such as object ACLs. Uh, because as much as possible, Swift 3 will just get out of the way when a Swift request comes in. Uh, so even if you set that, oh, this particular object should be private, uh, if a Swift request comes in for that request, uh, for that object, it will use the ordinary Swift auth mechanisms, which uh, will just go to bucket uh, container ACLs. Uh, next, if you're using Keystone as your auth service, uh, only Keystone and the end client know the signing keys. The Swift proxies never see it. This is good for security, but it means that uh, every client request has to go through Keystone to be validated. This uh, is better than it used to be, where we used to have two keystone requests for every client request, but uh, there isn't a good way around that currently. And finally, V4 signatures are great. Uh, that's definitely the direction that clients are typically going, but they can be a bit finicky. Uh, you need to know that the headers you receive as Swift are exactly the headers that the client had sent. And I've encountered issues with uh, running Swift behind Nginx, say, where uh, expect 100 continue headers get dropped, or uh, as I had said with the port numbers, I had a client that would double up port numbers in their signature. If you're running on non-standard ports, and uh, it, it just gets to be a little problematic sometimes. Be careful. Uh, as far as future directions, uh, there's a great outreachy intern that had been working on adding support for bucket versioning. Uh, this has been kind of a long time coming. This is one of the features that uh, I wanted to get support for and needed to push some upstream changes to Swift so that we have all the infrastructure to try to make it work. Uh, I want to improve multi-delete performance because currently we delete everything serially. Uh, I've already done the work of uh, adding some concurrency for Swift. I just need to pull it back into S3, uh, Swift 3 as well. And the last two are a little more pie in the sky, but uh, I'm hopeful. Uh, I've got a bit of a plan for a global bucket registry so that you can uh, support anonymous access through the S3 API, which uh, would be great, but it's complicated. <laughs> and uh, I actually have a proof of concept for an STS uh, secure token service like Endpoint. Uh, so you can issue temporary credentials to uh, that you can then hand off to applications so that they can use them and then they'll expire and the applications themselves never actually know your password. So uh, I just wanted to thank Coda in particular for being a great co-core reviewer. Uh, thank you for keeping me honest. 
Uh, thanks to Andre for uh, driving the V4 signature support, and thanks to Karen for uh, uh, being a great outreachy intern and working on versioning. Uh, yeah, go guys. Uh, any questions? You talked about uh, some of the, the caveats or compromises that you had to make yep. uh, when you, during bimodal when you're using both the Swift API and the S3 API. Uh, do you have any idea how, uh, how, what you're feeling, how common that is for people that do they, like I, I've heard a lot of times where the reason that you want S3 support is because this application only knows how to talk to S3, so we use Swift 3 for that app and then everyone else uses their own accounts with the Swift API. Do a lot of people go back and forth or they migrate? I have or? no idea. Uh, it's something that I would like to get more feedback on, but, uh, so I, I okay. So, um, Do you have we, any we have users on that? that can only work with Horizon, right? So Swift provides a nice user interface, right? You can, you can okay. look at the containers. And then we have um, traditional S3 support for the rest of the users, and they're on the command line, and they want to go to both Amazon and to the uh, Swift stack. Right? We actually run Ceph S3 as well. And so we've got multiple tiers, and we need to be able to, to shuffle things between all of them. Mm -hmm. yes. No. No, I don't understand yet, I don't think. Okay. Uh, well, so, so, Right, so, we, so I guess the, the user uh, base that we have, the, the partition into those that can only use the web browser and those that are comfortable on the command line. And those that are comfortable on the command line also have legacy S3 buckets. Like they're, they're using Amazon S3, they're using Ceph S3, and hmm. now they need Swift as well because it's a new tier of storage. And so everything's got to move between the three layers. Uh, no, we, I wonder so if Timur and so. Joe's presentation from yesterday might be handy for that. Uh, they had a presentation on syncing between Amazon and Swift. Uh, yeah. But it, it sounds like the users themselves are kind of partitioned between, uh, okay, either we want Swift or we want S3. Still? Um, yes. Now, for a lot of reasons that you mentioned, we, we, we like Swift. I mean, we, we would prefer to have... Um, Things to be more visible. Uh, ACLs are another, another uh, big hang-up on on S3. Is that you know you have to apply the ACL all the way down to the object, and in in the Swift case, your your bucket or your sorry container is either open or or private. Yeah. Right. And that just makes it a whole lot more user friendly. And we, we do have a use case too for having the per object ACLs. Yeah. Uh, so it'd be nice to have full handy. compatibility between the two APIs, but. Yeah, I, I've debated about trying to plumb off details all the way down to the object server, but it gets ugly. Yeah. <laughs> but it was a good call. <clears throat> so besides the traditional request like putting, getting objects and all that that comes with that, did you ever have requests for supporting other S3? Um, features, for example, in, in Swift itself we have expiring objects, for example. In S3 you can define a policy that basically also expires objects. And uh, as far as I remember, you can do that also using the API. Were there ever yep. requests um, to support that? Uh, so I've not looked into supporting it yet. Uh, I'm willing to bet the customers have asked about it. Uh, I'm sure Joe could give me some confirmation there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But uh, yeah, the policy documents, as I recall, are kind of complicated. And sure. uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Trying to expire it to another storage tier or something would be interesting, but hard. 
Uh, so Tim, uh, what about customers that aren't running in a Keystone environment and how is authentication handled in those cases? Sure, uh, so like the rest of Swift, there's a, uh, you can use any auth middleware you like. Uh, many are styled after temp auth, like Swath or our own Swift stack auth. Uh, and you, for middlewares like that, where you have the secrets in memory in the proxy server, uh, you can add v4 signature support very easily because we've added some hooks in uh, Swift 3 itself to uh, help out there. Well, thank you all for coming.